let's go in the opposite of how I've been talking about the series last few weeks, since I've started coming, Jade, and talk about Exide first this week, as there is admittedly something a bit more controversial this week, in at least amongst the fandom, than has been seen in the rest of the series thus far. Asuna's death. Uh, in the episode, as uh, Game Deus' Game Deus Kronos, rather, um, souped-up version of the Bugster virus is... It's a mass outbreak. Anyone infected with it is turned into a Bugster, and any, at least the base-level minion mook foot soldier Bugsters, and in contact with anyone else, also converts them into a Bugster to expand outwards. The, everyone is overwhelmed, um... Mighty Dr. Double X can only cure one person at a time, and that's not going to keep them from being reinfected, or at least potentially reinfected, with the rate it is spreading and mutating and just expanding. And it's essentially Masamune's win condition, because this way, as long as it spreads, he'll control everyone and everything. But by it being propagated through a bugster, that the person can destabilize themselves and spread the vaccine all in one massive burst to wipe out the infection and cure everyone, and the one that does it is Poppy. Because, at the moment, she's the only one who can. Um, Kuroto is off elsewhere, and let's face it, he's not a self-sacrificial kind of person, even though he has the actual lives. Um, Parada doing it would remove Emu's ability to transform and thus lose their win condition against Kronos. Admittedly, um, Parada does that after Poppy's death to stop Game Deus long enough for them to... I'll get to that. Um, and Kyria has been infected by his own Game Deus game virus infection, so he is also out from pulling the Heroic Sacrifice card. And thus, Poppy is the one who infects herself and cures everyone in a sequence that takes up more than ten minutes of the episode as they're trying to give the moments weight with how she... This, this is how she has chosen to make everyone smile as she's always wanted to. This is the culmination of her personal character arc and her personal demons with being a bugster and not even being aware of the sin she bears by taking someone else's life to cure all of these other people. It fits the series. It, it really does. It's reflective of her character. It's one of the best damn deaths I've seen in Kamen Rider. The problem is... It's done with a female writer, and I've just I've touched I've touched on this before in other videos, and the track record for female common writers and their deaths is horrible. We have a near ninety, we have an almost one hundred. It's in the ninety percentile of deaths amongst them. We've only got Nadeshiko, and I've, I've discussed this before in the Exide reviews as well. We've only got Nadeshiko on a technicality of she didn't really die the first time; she just lost her physical form, and then went off to recover and revived over time. Um, Mage, the first one, Mayu, from Wizard, got off on the technicality of not being a full writer, but part of a mass production writer trio for that show. We have um, Nico, who's ride player Nico, who mass production seemed to have skipped this, especially since they avoided the, her turning her to a Kronos last week. Um, I know people were angry about Nico not becoming Kronos the second last week. Frankly, Nico has always been an attachment to Tyga's character arc and less a character in and of herself, as in existing in the show for herself. She definitely has a defined character apart from anyone else, but she has always been most firmly attached to Tyga's character arc and been a part of that. Thus, it makes less sense for her to transform into Kronos than it does Taiga, even with how temporary that was. Frankly, if it was a permanent upgrade, I would have less issue with it than I do, because, let's face it, Taiga went back to using Bang Bang simulations almost immediately, so it seemed like this was that was kind of a pointless aside uh, 
now that I've been given further time to ruminate on it. Maybe, um, Nico going full Game Deus, Game Deus might have been interesting, but like I said, for the situation and Tiger's personal character arc and rediscovering his desire to actually help people through proxy of Nico, I don't have an issue with that one, especially since, well, Nico really didn't earn using Game Day, uh, Kronos' power herself because she got assistance in gathering all the Gasha trophies. She's registered, she was registered as the most advanced uh, ride player because she teamed up with other people, not on her own efforts, and they kept curing her, um, gaming infections, um, without her actually resisting and throwing them off herself. So, you know, there are all types of rationales that she's not actually... I don't want to say strong, but she didn't earn her abilities or the experience the way the others did by um, fighting up front in battle. Like we saw with uh, Graphite, she was... Oh, she probably was almost always in the background past the... Um, lower level bugster, she admittedly kicked ass on her own, and she's still pretty damn strong for, even amongst the rider tiers, at, what, 20 tons of force, uh, equivalent to a level 10. My point is, um, Nico becoming game deus doesn't make sense from a story perspective. That's, that's, that's the rationale I'm, that's the reasoning I've, I'm wrapping all these other rationales into. Asuna, though, um, I legitimately feel she has the best uh, death of a female common Rider we've had since Tackle, as it's not a waste. I mean, people love Yoko Minato from Guy, Marika. She had a horrible death. We went over this in my in my vlogs that series. Her, it's like it's one explosion in her transformed state, and she falls and dies, and like. As even when I was discussing this back then, other writers have survived that kind of injury in weaker states than Yoko used herself. So that made less sense than most people. Hell, Exide's um, spring movie tie-in, the 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 common Sentai Go writer that gave her get, that gave Yoko a better death than she got in the series she was a main character of. Okay, not main character, secondary character of. But that's pretty much the curse of the female common writer, as has been written. Horrible, horrible deaths that are entirely wastes of a life. And that is why people get so angry when Toei keeps doing it just on principle. They have fucked this up for years. Neo Heisei has been far better about it, but yet they keep doing it. It's like, okay, for, for um... The track record for Neo Heisei, we have had one, and that's Yoko, but there's nonetheless been this disrespectful idea towards female writers being a thing by their complete absence. Um, so you, you essentially get a trade-off. Heisei phase one, they exist, but they all die horribly with the implication in each one saying they should have never become a writer to begin with. Heisei phase two, They've been mostly absent, but the ones we have have had a far better track record of, well, living, or being relevant characters to the stories they are part of, instead of, you know, thrown in as an afterthought. So, Neo Heisei has been better, I wouldn't say they've been perfect, but that's the thing with really the thing with Asuna's death that diverges from every single one since Tackle. It had a point. She gave her life to save others and more grandly the world by curing this in the way realistically or at least situationally only she could have as a completed bugster that could um spread this cure, and I get why people are mad with it on principle, but structurally, from a story perspective, this is really damn effective. I mean, the show has been very good about 
admittedly, Asuna was annoying at the beginning, but only at the beginning, and that didn't last long before you just started having her grow on you, and we had this whole arc with her um, development as a character in the middle of the show with her turning evil, and that's when he realized, don't kill her off, she's a good character, we want her to become a good again. And we had that, and we had her being a good supporting player and even combatant when the situation arose, so she wasn't being wasted, but near the end of the series, it was just Cronus's power tier was too high for her to consider entering battle too much, especially since the danger posed with Kronos is if she joined in battle with them, um, Kronos could easily just straight up permanently kill her with Kronos' powers. The only time we saw her engage Kronos directly was when she was backing up Muteki, uh, Emu as Muteki uh, against him few episodes ago, when he was still trying to outright kill Parade, and even then, she was also backed up by Kyria, so there wasn't much of a... she was not in as severe a danger um, with that. And, like, I guess this is what it's been building up to as. She's one of the few people who who could deliver this vaccination. She was the only one in, the situ in that situation that could do it, and she's the one that thought, that even thought of spreading it outwards like that. So, I don't think this is a bad death. Despite her dying, I think it does avoid the curse of the female commoner. Not entirely, it is still superficially hitting all of those marks that get people angered at it, and I understand why you people are at, why you, other, everyone else might be angry at it, because on principle, it, in principle, it is the same damn issue we have had with all other appearances of female common writers. They die. More than any other... It's like... It's a crapshoot if the guys get killed. A lot of them... Usually, the happenstance is... Um, actually, it varies in happenstance with the guys, but this is... It really feels to me like they're avoiding most of the sin beyond her just dying by having it matter to the bigger story, instead of being worthless to it. So yeah, that allows them, to, that removes one of Kronos's blocks to them actually beating him this time, because all of the other um, infected humans would have just been straight up hostages that he could have thrown against them to keep them from fighting Kronos in his super big game Deus Bugster monster form. But now with that free, they can all fight the big Kronos game Deus monster form, and the show pulls a hat trick on us. They fight him with level one. This is actually pretty ingenious because game Deus is Kronos's super Bugster form is one of the giant um, viral amalgamations we see we saw in the early part of the series that had stopped appearing, so we'd forgotten about it. And also level one's ability to separate that bugster form from its host. So it's like the going back to the level one armors to do this is like so unexpected, and yet it makes so much damn sense. And with Parad holding um, the giant Game Deus monster down, um, they just ki um, all five of the main protagonists just rider kick him, rider kick them apart. But here's where we get the other issue: Parad deciding to use Mighty Doctor Double X and the Game Deus vaccine to get rid of Game Deus permanently by inserting it into his driver, so it infects him as well. You didn't need to do this. You really didn't need to do this. Um, as Mighty Doctor Double X is a dual cartridge gas shot, it can only be used in the Gosh Key Slasher or per Paradox's Parable Gun, since it's the only one that has the it has the dual slots to even accept it outside of the driver. So what Parad could have done is inserted into his parable gun, turned it into its gun mode, and shot 
uh, Gain Deus the exact same way that XI did a couple episodes ago to paralyze him for more permanent um, removal because that would have gotten rid of him and prevented Kronos from um, doing him in. Hell, that actually raises another question. Why didn't Mighty Doctor... Why didn't they try using Mighty Doctor Double X to cure Game Deus Kronos when he was Game Deus Kronos? Because at that moment, Game Deus was a bugster himself, so because, because of that, the higher order of succession for the viruses, that should have worked. Or is that going to be the twist for next time because, well, Parad dies from using Mo Mighty Doctor Double X to remove both of them, so they're without the power of Muteki. But we saw in the preview for next episode that Emu still possesses some level of power as Xaid, at least in the series epilogue after they dealt with Kronos. So are they going to fake us? No, they can't be faking us out. The previews show that Game Deus still becomes Kronos, so it's not like he's been cured of everything himself. But regardless, they're without the power of Xaid and Muteki to counter um, the power of Pause again. Because Parad is finally gone, uh, Amu's finally cured of his own game disease. So, this raises the question of, is the final twist of the series for defeating Kronos going to be that Emu's um, game disease is too deep to ever um, completely cure because he's patient zero? Or, I don't know, it seems like... They're going for this last big twist after Parad's death to finally wrap everything, but we've had a lot of twists, so it's starting to feel a bit like Deus Ex Machina, even though it's been justified in the story. All, all these points have inevitably been, been justified in the story to varying extents. So yeah, that's my take pretty much on Asuna's death. It's not a bad one. I can understand why people would take issue with it, but removed of the curse of the female common rider completely just ignoring that structurally it is a good death i mean no death is a good is completely good death but you can see it being a culmination of the entire direction of where the character was going instead of it coming out of nowhere and interrupting an actual character arc yes Jeed, episode 6. Um, I don't have much for this one. It's pretty... Um, continuing on from last time, um, Ultraman Zero joins Riku in battle to fight this... Whatchamacallit? it? The Elect King... The, the Balial Fusion... Elect King, Bailey Fusion Monster, Chimera, Chimera Barrows? Chimera Barrows. No, not Chimera... Eh. No, um... Thunderkiller? Yeah, it's Thunderkiller. Uh, I have the wiki pulled up because I am terrible with names for the show. And, yeah, Jeed was doing hor just horribly against it, even though he tries a few different um, powers and abilities against it and nothing, but Zero shows up and it instantly retreats, making the populace think that Zero is the hero they need, even though it's not the one they deserve. So, um, Riku's feeling a bit down that his own personal efforts are not being, um, recognized by the populace because, you know, part of what's motivating him as a hero right now is one, the Toku show that has shown him the power of heroism, and two, the need to help people, and in turn, redeem the image of himself, because, you know, his dad is Balial. So, and with, um, I'm forgetting the guy's name, with Leto, um, after being transformed into Zero, he's kind of like, high in adre adrenaline and seeing if he can't be a hero full-time as it's so different than the mundane existence of a salaryman that he um, works as to support his family and you know he's just like it's and it's an excitement that he's not had to 
take on in a while, and so with Riku feeling down, he decides maybe he can step up as an Ultraman. And this pretty much runs into the odd couple plots of see how the grass is already the grass is always greener, let's see how the other person lives. And yeah, it goes how you would expect. Not how I expected, though. I expected a stupid body swapping plot. But what they actually do is they build an image inducer for Riku so he can spend a day working Leto's job while Leto spends a day under Waiha, um, training his ass off to possibly be in the best shape he can to be a good host for an Ultraman. Versus, you know, Riku who already has very high stats, um, his physical ability and parameters are through the roof, even though he doesn't have much skill in his abilities yet. So there's a good contrast where, um, where Leto's working skills are all learned and adep he's adept in, so Riku can't do the job of a salaryman very well, especially since those are very demanding on people's time and work ethic. Whereas, um, Leto can't do the physicality stuff Laiha puts him through, which would require to be in the best, I already said that, in the best shape to be an Ultraman. And they pretty much get a bit of respect of each, each other's, um, prof not so much profession in Riku's case, because he kind of does just slum around when he doesn't have his part-time work, but... It's like, it's more, it's recognizing more of what other people do is just as valid as what you do, even though you're not exactly in the same pursuit. You should, just because someone isn't in the line of work you, you have, there's, it's no less valid than what you spend your life doing. Pretty much. Um, with this followed up on, um, with the, I'm forgetting the name again, Thunder Killer. Re, uh, manifesting again, because K Fukude, how did I get that one right? Fukuide, um, is going after Riku for unexplained reasons, and this time he's able, uh, Riku is able to beat it using his newest form of Acro Smasher. Burning solid Acro, Acro Smasher. And his G Claw weapon, which it kind of seems like an um, afterthought battle. It does feel a bit curb stompy with how, um, even though he had difficulty doing it at the beginning of the episode, he had no difficulty with it at the end of the episode, even though he didn't really change his tactics much, just used a different form change than he didn't use before. Hmm. Not the most effective of episode, but at least it's continuing to build respect among the cast about... Well, everything. There, there's worse filler episodes out there, but honest, honest, it doesn't recede more of Zero's presence in the show, which I like. Um, it's more establishing him as the mentor figure to Riku, and tying more into a uh, more active arc of getting Zero into the show, I guess, since he's not been involved much in things, and... We've got a while to go for the, for um, that. So, decent episode, but definitely skippable filler. I think the most interesting thing for the story arc, though, comes at the end of the episode, where Kay meets with Balliol, and we see that it is a master-servant relationship, where all the evil he's doing has been infused into him through some, type, some desiring of power we're not given insight into yet. So... I'm curious about where that's headed and what Kay's reason for doing this is beyond evil, because there should be a reason beyond evil for someone like this to do that. So, that's all I got this week. I hope it was brief enough. Exide finale next week. Um, might need to take a few weeks off after we get Exide done, because build is coming. I'm looking forward to build. Um... Got some other things to say on the topic of build, but I'm going to save those for when we actually start um, discussing build on the in these videos, so I'll leave that alone for now. I'll see you all later.